Father, we're, we're thankful that Sister Grace is back and that, uh, that all is going well and we're believing that in faith, Father. And we're thankful, Father, that you're in control. We also lift up our sister Faye Holder, who's having a hard time keeping her balance and she's fallen many, many times and even as of recently. And so we just lift up our sister Faye. She's been with us since almost the beginning and we just ask God that you would just increase her strength physically, mentally, and spiritually, Father, and that she would be refreshed as she's at home today. So we love you, Father, and we praise you. We ask, Almighty God, that you would speak to us throughout the remainder of this service, that you alone would be seen and heard, not me, that you would be seen and heard working through me, and God, that you would get all of the honor, glory, credit, and praise. And Father, I recognize that without you, it's impossible and only through your grace and your mercy and forgiveness can I even come forward before your people. So I thank you for the honor it is to share your word. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, we come into agreement and we rebuke every enemy from trying to steal, kill, and destroy from this house and all who dwell in it. May we freely be able to receive the victory from your word today. And bless our children and all those that are teaching them today. Thank you, Father, that you are in control. In Christ's name, everybody said together. Amen. amen and amen. God is good. Amen. Let's give him a clap of praise. He's worthy, worthy, worthy to be praised. If you're able, please stand for a moment. You've got one minute to go say hey to three people. Ready, set, go. All right, all right, all right. Everybody grab a seat. God is good, amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise you, Lord. We're getting ready to... Read something that God says to a king by the name of Hezekiah. How many people have heard of Hezekiah before? Uh, Hezekiah, at the point in Scripture, in the text where we're getting ready to go, he's, he's not been leading the people the way that he should have. And there's another king that comes on the scene, the king of Assyria. His name is uh, Sennacherib. Again, he's the king of Assyria. And he's coming up against Judah and King Hezekiah. Hezekiah finds a man of God by the name of Isaiah. How many people have heard of Isaiah before? Yeah. Okay, look at your neighbor and say he wrote a book. <laughs> uh, Hezekiah comes and finds a brother uh, named uh, Isaiah, and he seeks the help of Isaiah, knowing that Isaiah is a mighty man of God. Now, uh, Isaiah is not mighty by his own valor. It's by the power of God working in and through him. Amen. Well, you can't do it on your own, and neither can I. Praise the Lord that we understand that. Hezekiah not only seeks help through Isaiah going before the Lord, but Hezekiah himself, according to the text, he also seeks God, and he prays for himself and for Judah as well. But I want to look at what God says in response to Hezekiah during this time. Remember, Hezekiah was not living like a good man. But he realizes that he's about to face destruction. He realizes that the people of Judah are in trouble. And so he humbles himself 
and he desires to realign himself with what God has called him to do. I've been there before. Anybody else? Okay. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 37, verse 31, and watch what takes place, friends. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Isaiah chapter 37, the 31st verse. If you do not have your Bible, you can look along and read on the screen with us here in a moment. Isaiah, just before Jeremiah, Isaiah chapter 37, verse 31. Now, Isaiah goes through, or excuse me, uh, Hezekiah goes through praying to the Lord God, and this is what, this is what God has to say. Isaiah 37, 31, the word of God says this, praise the Lord. God's response here. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit, where? Upward. Now, I read this verse a week or so ago, and this thing just leapt out into my spirit. I mean, it just blessed me. It blessed me. It blessed me. So I, I, I just want you to listen to this because this one verse is where we're going to focus on for the next three or four hours here together. And I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit just ministers to your soul for, for, for the rest of your life on this verse right here. This is amazing. No matter where you're at in your life, whether you're at a high, whether you're at a low, uh, whether you're at a low somewhere in between, whether you're feeling good this morning, whether you're feeling rough this morning, whether you wanted to come here, whether someone drug you here, whether you're in love with your spouse, whether you were arguing with your spouse on the way to church this morning, no matter where you are, if you've got a need, maybe you don't feel like you've got a need, no matter where you are, listen to this. Isaiah 37, 31. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root how? Downward. downward. Listen to that. The root, it should take place downward, and then it should bear fruit where? Upward. Now, I mean, man, this is so beautiful, the word of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's not talking about a plant. And understand that before we go any further and before we go forward in, 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 the, in, in the rest of the text, it's not talking about a plant. Who's it talking about? People. Amen. It's talking about people. And not only is it talking about Judah, but the same God that's speaking of Israel is the same God that has those same character qualities and traits to you and I. Amen. And so look at the 31st verse again. And the surviving remnant. Anybody in here ever felt like a remnant before? Like that's all that's left, man. Just whew. how did I get through that? How am I going through this? Will I ever make it out? It's the worst that it's ever been. Anybody ever said that before? Oh, it's the worst that it's ever been. Let me show you some good news in the word of God, verse 31. What's the third word? And the what? Survive. Everybody look up here for a moment. If you're here, no matter what you're going through, the good news through Jesus Christ is, is that you're still surviving. Amen? You're still surviving. Look at your neighbor and say, that's what it takes. <laughs> See, look, 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 don't let the enemy lie to you and make you feel that, that just surviving is a bad thing. No, 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 that's what it takes. You understand? That's what it takes. You've got to fight to survive in this world. And Jesus himself said that Satan wants to steal, kill, and what? Destroy. So surviving is a great thing. Amen. Look at what it says, verse 31, and the surviving remnant. Remnant means what's left. And so maybe your marriage is in shambles. Praise God for a remnant. Amen? Praise God for a remnant. And maybe you've lost your job. Praise God for a remnant. You're still surviving and opportunities still await. There's a remnant. And maybe you woke up this morning feeling like life was not worth living. There's still a remnant. You're still surviving. There's still a remnant. Listen to this. God doesn't need 100% of your battery in order for you to work. God just needs a remnant. He just needs a 1% in order for God to do a restoration, in order for God to do a redeeming, in order for God to do a salvation. He just needs a little bit left. 
He just needs a remnant. And that's how good God is, amen? And you can't believe into the lie that you got to get yourself straight before you get saved. No, you'll never get straight without God and getting saved first. So look at how, look at how God does it. Remember, this is God talking here. Uh, verse 31, and the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall what? Again. Amen. It shall again. Watch this. The, the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take what? Root how? Downward. Okay. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear what? Fruit upward. Not talking about a plant, talking about actual literal people. And it says that the surviving remnant, the people, shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Listen to this. We're called as God's people to do the exact same thing today. You believe that? We're called to take root downward so that we can bear fruit how? Upward. Do you believe that, church? That's the truth. That's the word of God. We're called to take root downward so that we could bear fruit upward. Okay, again, listen, to take root downward so we could bear fruit upward. Let me tell you what to take root means. To take root means to become fixed. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not going nowhere. I mean, I'm talking about your faith in Christ. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not moving off of what I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not moving off believing that the, the, the living God is the one true living God. I'm not moving off believing on his word. I've taken root in my faith, and I'm not going anywhere. There's no one that's going to be able to convince me any different. If they could, it wouldn't be a strong faith, would it? I'm not going anywhere. My faith has taken root. So we take root downward to get strong. So to take root means to become fixed. It means to establish yourself. It means to draw nourishment from your roots, which are being rooted in the word of God. Amen? And we cannot expect, listen to this, friends, we cannot expect to see godly fruit in our lives upward if we have not taken root downward. We must, we absolutely must be rooted in the word of God. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18. Head towards the front of your Bibles, you'll run into it. 1 Kings chapter 18. Verse 20 is where we're going to begin, friends. First, First Kings 18, verse 20. And I want to talk about deep roots before we get into fruit. Remember, if we want godly fruit, there must be godly roots. Amen? Amen? 1 Kings 18, verse 20, the word of God says this, praise the Lord. So, so Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? In other words, he's saying, make up your mind, who will you serve? He then says in verse 21, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. And let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you can call upon the name of your God, lowercase g, and I will call upon the name of the Lord God and the God who answers by fire, he is God. 
And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Now remember, this, this, literally, this really literally happened, okay? Listen, verse 25, then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, answer us! But there was no voice, and no one answered, and they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he, he is a god. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep, and he must be awakened. Verse 28, the text says that they cried aloud and they cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Hear that. The text the scripture plainly says that there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. They were guilty of believing in a false god and therefore they had no roots. Look at the 30th verse. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. You got to understand where Elijah's going right now. He's excited, man. He let the bad guys go first. Nothing took place except they ended up looking like even larger idiots than they were before they started. They went as far as cutting themselves. The scripture says blood gushing everywhere. Finally, he says, I've had enough. Now you're going to see that there is one living true God. And he says to them, he's not shameful. He's not fearful that God might not show up either. Have you ever prayed and actually wondered, I wonder if God's going to do that? You ever done that? I, I've been there. I'll share that with you. I'll be honest. I've been there. He's not worried about that. He's not worried about his God getting ready to show up. He's not worried is God going to show up and send fire from heaven. He tells the people, he doesn't want them driven away. He wants them up front and center. He, he says, y'all come on near me. Come over here. Watch what's getting ready to take place here. So look at verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. Everybody look up here for a moment. Elijah has just done what many would think is the impossible. This thing is supposed to catch fire, y'all. And he fills it with water. Put water on it three different times and the trench fills up. Think about that. He's doing what seems to be the impossible. I've got a moment in my life that, uh, that is very fresh, very real, that has to go along with facing, it, facing the giant. I want to share this with you. Um, and to God be all honor, glory, and praise, it really just blessed my socks off. My wife found a, a camp at, uh, at a college, Liberty University. And at this camp, they had, they had scouts and they had coaches that were coming watching boys play baseball. And on the website, it says, uh, for ninth graders only, up until 12th graders. So I'm figuring it's going to be like a couple hundred boys uh, out there running around and that the, 
the smaller ninth graders would be by themselves, you know. And so we sign Elijah, he's our oldest son, we sign him up and dad, I, I carry him on down there thinking that we're going to have a good camp playing in front of some scouts, you know. We get there and we're one of the first ones there and uh, he goes down into the dugout of this very, very nice stadium and $20 million stadium, plays top notch. He goes down to the dugout and he's sitting waiting for the other boys to get there and this guy comes up who I thought was a coach. And I'm sitting by the table where the players are signing in, and he looks, at the, he looks at the assistant coach who's there, and he says, I'm here for the camp. And my face hit the floor. I was like, that's a grown man. <laughs> He's getting ready to go pitch to my son? And this guy was 22 years old, sophomore, already in college, looking to transfer to this college. I'm saying, what did his mother sign him up for? This is the impossible. I pick up the phone and I call my father-in-law and I said, father-in-law says, hey, how's he doing? I said, I don't know yet, but they got guys coming here that look more like a man than I do. <laughs> he was the only rising ninth grader going up against juniors and seniors in high school and guys that were already in college. And I'm sitting up there in the top thinking, I got to go get my baby. Because <laughs> if I bring them back broken, the only saving grace I had in all of it was mama signed them up. <laughs> he got out there. They had two days to play, and they played in this rain that's been going on. Two days playing in the rain. He didn't have any errors. Didn't have any errors. And he did everything else that those other guys did. Everything else. So I'm sitting here now having a proud dad moment. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Doing the impossible, man. That's all God. I'm up there praying, man, praying, praying for two days. I'm just up there praying. I'm like, oh, proud to have a moment. And I say all that to bring the story to this. Then it got even realer. Is that a word, realer? It is now. It got even realer because he had been playing first base. That's his position. But he also, he also pitches. And I see him come out of the dugout and start walking across the field. And he didn't have his first baseman's glove on. He had his fielder's glove. And my father-in-law has now showed up. My father-in-law looks at me and says, Hey, he's going to pitch against these men? Uh, I was like, uh, looks like it. And he says, pick your phone up, man. Your 13-year-old son is pitching in a major university stadium against college kids. I can't, I get my picture going, I'm like, and then I'm like, pictures, I got to pray. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I said to my father-in-law, I said, he's got hope. All of these big boys are used to people slinging the ball 80, 90 miles an hour. And my son's only 13. They haven't hit a 13-year-old boy in six years. I said, man, they're not going to be able to touch him. Listen to this. No earned runs in two innings and only one earned hit and even struck one of them out and two of them swung so hard they hit their knee. <laughs> All of the dads were up there just pacing. I mean, these, these, these dads are just as geared up as their kids are. They're living through their kids. Hey, why can't you hit that? You need, ah! And I'm just sitting there just praying to my dad. My father said, Lord, just let him do what seems to be the impossible and make it possible. When your faith is in Christ, it doesn't matter the giant that you're standing in front of because God will take the small things and defeat what seems to be the great. God loves to take the broken things 
understand? And restore it and redeem it and lift it up and magnify it for his glory and say, looky here. Looky here. And so here's Elijah. Not day. Elijah here. And Elijah says, bring water. And they drench it. And he says, bring water again. And they drench it. And he says, bring, bring some more water. And they drench it. He says, everybody, everybody come close. Look at what takes place next according to the text. Verse 36. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Now listen, listen, listen. That's why God does things through the broken. That's why God loves to redeem. That's why God loves to restore. Because look at, look at what it just said. Let's get it, get it back on the screen. Get that verse back on the screen. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, watch it. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be what? Known. Let's read that out loud, that whole sentence on let it. One, two, three, go. Let it be known this day. Stop right there. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. And when our prayers can begin to look like that, when our prayers can begin to sound like that, God, do a work in my life and let it be known this day that there is God in Israel, that there is God in Amelia, that there's God in Blackstone, that there's God in Farmville, that there's God in Chesterfield, that there's God in my life. There's God in my life. Let it be known. You see, God will not be mocked. And when he's got someone that's willing to submit and be humble and surrender, God will use you all day long for his glory if you're willing to let him. God, let it be known. I mean, absolutely amazing what takes place there. Now look at it again in verse 36. It goes on to say, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things that you are what? And see, he's being obedient. You can never go wrong being obedient. Amen? You can never go wrong doing what God says do. Verse 37, answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their what, church? And that you, God, you, you, you have turned their hearts back. You see, Elijah is praying that upward fruit may be seen in order to glorify God and that others may see that God is alive and well and he is the one living, true, almighty God. And so he's asking that there be upward fruit. But remember, you cannot have upward fruit that is godly unless you have roots that are godly first. And we know that Elijah had that. Now look at verse 38, please. Then the fire of the Lord God did what? It fell. Then the fire of the Lord God fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. You remember the waters what made it look impossible, didn't it? And God ain't worried about the, what seems to be impossible. Amen? God's not worried about who seems bigger, who sees uh, the last longer, who sees tougher, who seems stronger. No one can outdo God. Amen? You believe that, church? No, you believe it? No one can outdo or outlast God. So look at verse 38 again, please. 1 Kings 18, 38, the word says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they what? They fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Remember, it was 450 of them, remember? It says, Seize the prophets of Baal. 
let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. They were punished for leading the people astray. But the people who remained, according to the text, believed God, glorified God. And it all took place so that others would see that God is alive and well. Elijah's fruit came upward because his roots were where, church? Downward. Tell your neighbor it takes faith. And that faith is in Christ alone. In Christ Jesus alone. By being rooted downward, fruit came upward. And all in the moment was well. Look at verse 41. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat, and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of what, church? Rain. And what makes this so amazing is that, you remember when Elijah prayed earlier that there'd be no rain? Everybody remember that? I mean, it had been three and a half years since he prayed that it would not rain. Everybody say three and a half. That's a long time. We go three weeks in Virginia, and the mud turns to dust, doesn't it? And we said, whoa, we need some what? It had been three and a half years since Elijah prayed that it would be no rain. God answered the prayer, and after three and a half years of being no rain, God sends the fire down that Elijah had asked for, and then Elijah said, whoa. Ahab, I, hit, I don't see it, but I what? Have you ever heard a hard rain, church? And depending on the text you're reading, it may not say rushing, it may say heavy, heavy rain, rushing rain. You know, there were some schools in a nearby county that had to turn their buses around uh, Friday because so much rain was coming it was flooding over the roads. I mean we're talking about rushing rain water. No rain for three and a half years. Again what seems to be impossible is possible with our Father God Almighty. Elijah says Whoa. we just seen this miracle of fire come from heaven. Ahab, Ahab, Ahab. Ahab can't hear it. Ahab can't hear it. There's a purpose in being in tune with the Spirit of the Lord. Amen? Ahab, Ahab can't hear it. He says, he says, whoa. Elijah says, Ahab, there's a what, church? Sound. Yeah. There's a sound of rushing wind, and I want you to go up there, and I want you to see it. And look at what takes place according to the text. Verse 42, so Ahab, verse 42, so Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of the Mount Carmel, and he, he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, he says, what, church? Go up now and do what? Look toward the sea. And Scripture says that Ahab, he, and he went up and he looked and said, there's what? Now listen, this is very important. And this is one thing that I always pray every time uh, I, I'm, I'm able to lead someone to Jesus Christ. Whether it's in church, whether it's at a gas station, whether it's uh, on a sidewalk, it doesn't matter. Whenever I lead someone to Jesus Christ, I always pray that the naysayers that have been in their lives would have to be silenced. Because even a mature Christian can find himself amongst a person who says nay to the things that the Father would say yay. Amen? And listen, listen, there might even be some church folks that you know of that just don't have the faith that you're banking on. Amen? And so you have to be very careful that when you try to touch and agree or when you try to come into agreement through prayer with someone that they've at least got the measure of faith that you got for what you're asking for in answered prayer. Amen? Hey, don't, don't, don't ask someone to be in prayer for a healing if they can't believe that God can do a healing. That's wasted time. Matter of fact, that's, that's a, a lack of faith. And the Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to what? Please God. 
Now, you got to know that when you ask someone to pray, if you're going to bank on them praying with you and come into agreement with you, that they can believe at least at the minimum for what you're believing for. And so he sends Ahab, and Ahab comes back. He says, go over to the sea and look. And it says that Ahab came back. Look at it, verse 43. And he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up, and he looked, and he said, there is nothing, no thing. There's nothing. But you remember earlier, Elijah said he didn't see anything. He what? You ever heard someone coming down your driveway, but you couldn't see him yet? Amen? You, you, you just knew. You just knew. We can't, and, and as Christians, listen to this, because I didn't plan on saying this, but I feel led my spirit to address it. We can't always rely on sight to prove our faith. That's no faith. Everybody understand that? In other words, in other words, let's say that your mama's in the kitchen cooking or your bride is in the kitchen cooking or how about this, ladies? Your husband's in the kitchen cooking. You know what they're cooking or maybe you don't know what they're cooking, but there comes a time, there comes a point in time that they've been in there for so long that you know the meal is either ready or getting ready to be ready, not because you saw it, but because you what? Yeah, yeah. And your nose talks to your what? Stomach. Yeah, yeah that, 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 yep, that's about how it is when it gets right. That's about right, right there. I probably got 10 more minutes and she's going to tell me to come in there. Or ladies, if your man's in there cooking, you're probably thinking, I better get up and fix that. It's burning. It's burning. It's just trying, it's trying to do good. Trying to do good. Make it more work if he just get out the way. If we could just get our faith at least to that degree of a level, to where we don't have to see it, but you can still sense it in the spirit to understand that even when I don't see things, I believe through faith in Jesus Christ that God is still working on my behalf. So if you're sick, you don't have to look better in order to believe that you're going to be better, do you? Amen? If your marriage is in shambles, it doesn't have to look like it's not in order for it to be on the way to being better, does it? You can't go off of what you're seeing in the attack, but you must understand where you want it to be when it's all said and done. And so Elijah says, I hear rain. He sends Ahab to go look out over the sea. Ahab comes back multiple times and he says, Elijah, I don't know what you're hearing, but ain't nothing, no thing. He says, nothing, no thing. He says, but nothing's there. Now, I don't want you to point at anybody, but have you ever asked a Christian to pray for you and they were just Mr. Downer? I'm the only one? Hey, raise your hand, be a blessing to someone. Okay, everybody else got perfect saints uh, as their friends. Perfect saints. Y'all need, need to get me in on your friendship circles. I know that, and let me just be open with you. I know that in my life as being a Christian before, I've had someone come up to me and say, hey, will you pray for this? And I'm like, yeah, I'll pray, but I don't know that you're going to get that. <laughs> I am the wrong one that that person should have asked in that moment, wasn't I? I'm just being real. Yeah, I'll pray. I don't think God's showing up for that. I mean, you know, I mean. Because I found myself in that moment looking through a lens of what I call reality. And I'll say to myself, and I don't mean to sound judgeful, but I say, oh my goodness, they're asking for the sun, moon, and the stars. And they ain't even living like a Christian. Remember, if you want fruit upwards, you got to have roots where? Downwards. You know what else I love about Elijah? He said that when Ahab came back all those times, he said, there's nothing, man. There's nothing, man. There's nothing, man. There's nothing, man. Elijah looks at him and says, go back seven times. Go back. Go back. Go back. He didn't allow his friend to shake his faith. And look at what takes place. 
Verse 43, and he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and he looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. Now this actually happened. This is no fairy tale. This actually took place. It said that Ahab goes and looks a seventh time and a, a cloud the size of a man's hand. A man's hand rises up over the sea. Now I could think that Ahab could have gone one or two ways. First one is, praise God, there's the Russian rain. Or the other way he could have went was this. That's it? I, I mean, that's it? I mean, the prophet, the prophet of all people, the prophet said he heard a sound of rushing rain. And that cloud out there? The size of my fist, that's, that's, that's all he's got? That ain't enough to water a, a flower pot. But how many of you have ever experienced in your life that God loves to take the small things? <laughs> Remember, he just needs a remnant. He was speaking to the whole house of Judah, and he told them, I just need a remnant. <laughs> Listen, that was the entire house of Judah. And God said, I don't need half of you to be right. I don't need 75% of you to be right. I don't need 40% of you to be right. I just need, here's the word he used, a surviving remnant. So whatever you got going on in your life, the good news through Jesus Christ is this. God's got it covered, folks. All he needs is a little piece of your remnant. A little piece. So that just puts joy in my spirit as I talk. A little piece of your remnant is all God needs to take what you got going on. No matter how bad, no matter how hard, no matter how ugly, no matter how deep, no matter how heavy, no matter how devastating, God just needs a little piece of your surviving remnant to restore everything you got. Israel became a nation. You want to know why Israel became a nation? Because there was a surviving remnant of Judah, y'all. And God was able to take a surviving remnant and multiply it, establish it, set it in a place so that no man could ever take it down again. And since then, no man has, no nation has. And as many armies and nations that have tried to, no one has. And according to the authority and the word of God, no one ever will, and that's why it has never happened again. Because God said it wouldn't. Israel is surrounded all the way around by her enemies. They can't even, in all of them hate her. All of them want Israel wiped off the map. But they can't get enough together to come in like mind and destroy Israel. Because even though it looks like they could, God said it'll never happen. And to this day, that's why it has not happened. He took a remnant right there that we're reading from. He took a remnant that was surviving, and he established it so that it would never again be destroyed. Look at what takes place next. Now see, that's, that's, that's good stuff. I mean, God is good. Amen? He says, verse 44, let's get 44. First uh, Kings 18, 44. And at the seventh time, he said, Behold, a, a little cloud, like a man's hand, is rising from the sea. And he said, Go up. Say to Ahab, Prepare your chariots and go down, lest the rain do what? Stop you. Lest the rain stop you. So the servant... The servant is involved. He's gone out to the sea. Ahab's up on the hill. Ahab's looking too. Don't, 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 get, don't get confused about this. Ahab was there with the servant. That's why most people just preach on Elijah and, and the servant. I'm adding Ahab into the mix today because Ahab was one of the three. Ahab was there. Listen to this. Don't forget about Ahab. Ahab was there when, when Elijah said, hey, 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 there's a sound. I hear it. I hear it. He 
tells the servant, I don't want you to miss it. He, he tells the servant, go and look over to see. The servant comes back. He then, then says to the servant, he says, go and get who? Go and tell who? Ahab. Ahab's part of what's going on. He's part of what's happening here. So the servant, the servant sees the, not Ahab, it's the servant. The servant sees the hand, the size of the cloud, and says in verse 44, and at the seventh time he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, Go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. It's getting ready to rain so heavy that it could stop a man from traveling. Hadn't rained in three and a half years. And it's getting ready to rain so heavy that it could stop a man from moving. And all of that is coming forth from a cloud the size of a what? Something happens here. Verse 45, and in a little while the heavens grew black with clouds and wind. And there was a great what? rain and Ahab went to Jezreel and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he gathered up his garment and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel I want you to focus on something uh, again quickly in order to set the table Elijah looks at Ahab and the servant is present. He tells Ahab, he says, go up to the mountaintop and I want you to eat and drink. Then he looks at the servant, he tells the servant, he says, go over to the sea and I want you to watch. The servant comes back, he says to Elijah, he says, there's nothing, there's no thing, man, there's nothing. And, 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 and Elijah says to the servant, he says, go back how many times, church? See, we're learning, amen? They go back seven times and then, when he does come back, there was a cloud the size of a man's what, church? His hand, his fist. Then he says to the servant, he says, go and tell who? Ahab. Then he tell him to get in the chariot and take off before the rain comes so much that it stops you. Hadn't rained in three and a half years, Ahab and servant, but understand that there's a rain coming so hard that God is going to show himself after bringing fire down from the heavens, now rain down from the heavens. God will be known here. But there's someone that we cannot forget. We've talked about Ahab. We've talked about the servant. But look at verse 42. Because the entire time in verse 42, we're told what Elijah is doing. It says in the 42nd verse of 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42, it says that he bowed himself down on the earth and he put his face between what? He's praying. He's not stretching. He's not getting loose. He's going deep. He's praying. He knows that God had held off the rain from his prayer for three and a half years, and all of a sudden something major is getting ready to take place again in the life of Judah, in the life of the, God's people. And when the servant comes back from the sea, while Ahab still up on the mountaintop eating and drinking, the servant comes back from the sea, and he finds Elijah down on his knees with his face down on the ground with his face tucked between his knees and he's praying and in the process of his prayer he comes back and he says hey Elijah there's nothing you understand how even good people can sometimes try to knock your faith off the block even when they don't mean to even when they don't mean to don't, don't lose what's taking place right here so he goes back to the sea good man good man goes back to the sea and a good man sees nothing and a good man goes back to a praying man and he says hey hey Elijah hey, hey. man I, I hate to be the one to tell you this man but I know you said what you said I know you heard what you heard but there's still what nothing you got to be careful who you keep yourself around in times of your desperate prayers you got to be careful who you let in you got
got to be careful who might say no when your faith is saying yes. You understand that? You've got to be careful who say no when your faith is saying yes. I can, it's almost like you could just see it, folks. Elijah's on the ground, head tucked between his knees in prayer, in fervent, fervent, fervent prayer. It's almost like you could see it. He doesn't even break stride. He doesn't even look to his left to talk to the servant. He just, in the midst of praying, says to him, without breaking stride in faith, go back seven times and still keeps praying. Something I learned off of this a long time ago, you cannot ever let a distraction intercept your prayer time with your heavenly father. Because Satan will do it all day long if you allow him to. If you're going to get in your vehicle and you're going to use your ride from point A to point B as a prayer time, here's an idea. Shut the radio off. Even though it's Christian music, it can cause your heart and your mind to begin to sing the tune of the song. Whereas you started out in prayer and now you're ending out in song. Three songs later, you forgot what you were even praying about and never said amen in the name of Jesus. You ever been there before? I have. So easily can we be distracted. Here's another one. If you're going to be in prayer from point A to point B in the process of point A to point B, and I know this is going to be really hard, and I know that this is going to seem like the impossible, but trust me, with the help of God, you can do it. Turn your phone off. And I know for some of you that's going to be barring a miracle. But just shut it off. You want to know one of the most major excuses people use with those devices today? Well, what if it's a... Well, what did you do 20 years ago when they didn't even have it? And all of you, all of you survived and you're here today. What? Without a... F what? Now, I've got to confess this as your pastor. There's times where I leave my house and I don't have my phone and I'm in the driveway. I could turn around, but there's times where I keep kicking it, man. I'm just, nope, I ain't going back to get it. I need quiet for a little bit. I need quiet for a little bit. Uninterrupted, quiet for a little bit. I, even I need that. And so if I'm going to take the time to talk to the creator of heaven and earth, and maybe I need to make a way so that it's uninterrupted out of reverence, holiness, and respect. Fellows, how many of you has your wife ever looked at you and she said, I just want to talk to you? Yeah? The other guys are just scared to move right now. Just, <laughs> oh, man, don't bring that up, man. She's going to get in the car right after church and she's going to tell me, you know, Pastor Lee brought that to my mind. I need to talk to you. But you know what else she's looking for in the talking process? She's also just hoping that you're going to take time to what? See, you guys are brilliant. Just listen. So if I'm going to take time to talk to God, then I need to take time to do what? Listen to God. And if I really want God to talk to me, then I should really be willing to listen no matter what that takes. Even if it means getting rid of all the devices, shutting everything down for just a few moments so that from point A to point B, I can hear clearly. I can almost see that Elijah's done to a point. Man, how many times are you going to come here and talk to me about that cloud? I done told you I heard it. You believe it in me or not? I done told you I heard it. And so I could just see Elijah not even breaking stride. Like, man, you are interrupting my conversation with God. So I could just see him saying, go back seven times. Scripture, scripture does not say that Elijah got up, broke stride, and explained everything to the servant, does it? No, no, no. It says he said one thing and one thing only. Go back seven times. I want to show you something concerning the depth of our roots to the fruit coming upward. Go to Jeremiah really quickly. Jeremiah chapter 17. We're 
We're going to begin with the fifth verse. And this is, this is beautiful right here, what takes place. Jeremiah 17, beginning with verse 5. The, the word of the Lord says this, friends. It says, thus says the Lord God. So listen to this. Thus says the Lord God. Cursed is the man who trusts in who? Man. And makes flesh his what? So when, listen, when someone says, you can't do it. Don't give in to that. Don't put your trust into that. Keep your faith in God alone through Jesus Christ. May that be where your soul trust is at. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Let me tell you what that means. That means the more you listen to man, the more your heart is going to be veering away from the will of God. Verse 6. He is like a shrub. This is the man who, this is the individual that trusts man and their self more than they do God. That person is like a shrub in the what, church? In the desert and shall not see any good come. And you may think, well, I've, I've not been trusting in the Lord and my life seems, seems okay. Does it really? Does it really? Have you never had a moment of loneliness? you never felt a moment of brokenness? Have you never felt a moment of emptiness and wondered what else is there? Have you never had any longing, thinking that there must be something else? Have you never had any question ever about does God exist? Is your, is your life really okay without God? I'd, I'd really like to talk to you about that if you're willing to meet me up here one day and just show you what the text has to say about that. Because if you think that it is okay without God, then you've been deceived by the enemy. And if you think that where you're at without God is okay, then imagine how much greater and how much more victory you could have in your life with the Spirit of God giving you the strength rather than yourself. So verse 6 says that that person is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is what? A couple years ago, I was asked to do a hospital visit to a very, 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 very wealthy individual. Never met him before in my life in person. And I walk into the hospital room, and I shake his hand, and I'd heard from the person who asked me to go meet with this individual that it was not looking good, and that he probably just had a couple days left to live. And this guy was wide awake. I mean, he knew his end was in the next 40, 48 to 72 hours. He knew. So I walk into the room, and I look at him, and I say, hey, bud, I said, uh, what are they saying? He said, well, they just left my room right before you come in, and I've got two days at best. I said, okay. I said, uh, I said, how can I help you? And he looked at me, and he said, well, before you get started on why you're here, let me tell you something on why I'm here. And what that individual told me as a multimillionaire will never, ever leave my memory. At least I hope it doesn't. He said to me, he said, you know, he said, I'm a very wealthy man because of all that I've done in my life. He said, I've been in more business meetings than you could ever dream of. He said, I've been on more golf courses and more luxurious resorts than you'll ever know. He said, I've been around more prominent people then you would even have clue of who they are. He said, I've got more money in my bank account right now than you'll probably ever see in your lifetime. He said, but when that doctor just left my room right before you came in here, something hit me like a sledgehammer. 
It all means absolutely nothing, doesn't it, Pastor? It all means absolutely nothing. He said, I'm married, but I've got a wife at home that I hardly know. He said, we've just been coexisting through over 50 years of marriage. He said, I was never home because I was always money-driven. I was always success-driven. I was always people-driven, never God-driven. You talk about a man that just moments ago realized all of a sudden what life was about. Flooding into him in a matter of moments. He said, my wife raised our two children because I was never home. You talk about words of a wise man, whereas moments earlier he had no wisdom. He said, my wife raised our two children because I was never home. Because I looked at work as being more important just to bring money into my account. And I hid it all under the skies of providing for my family. He said, so now I have two adult children with multiple grandchildren, all of whom hardly have a relationship with me other than just coexisting. And then he looked at me, and in his last words that I ever heard him say on this earth, he looked at me and he said, Pastor, you've got to be able to say no When the meetings mount up, you've got to be able to say no. When the phone rings time and time again, you have to be able to say no. When people want you more than what you're able to give, you have to be able to say no. He said, you're looking at a walking dead man that regrets just about everything that I've ever done. It all meant nothing. The only thing at that moment that mattered to that man was not how successful he was, his wife was, his children were, his grandchildren were. The only thing that mattered in that living, waking moment was whether or not his soul was saved. He fell into the situation of verse 6. That man was like a shrub in the desert who didn't see any true good come. He was blinded by the success, blinded by the ways of the world, blinded by the money in his bank account, blinded by promotion, blinded by feeling like everything was going okay. And because it was, it truly was in the physical, he allowed himself to ignore the spiritual. And he continued to go chasing after something that at the end paid zero dividends. It says that that type of individual in verse 6 should dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Maybe there's some people in here that are blinded spiritually because they're chasing physically what you think to be the terms and the definition of success in your life. But then comes verse 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in who? The Lord. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. You see, that's not you. It says whose trust is the Lord. So my trust, my trust is not only in the Lord, my trust is God. It is God and there's no other. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. Verse 8, he is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes for its leaves remain green and it is not anxious in the year of drought for it does not cease to bear what church <laughs> because because the roots go down fruit comes up let's stand and pray Because the fruit is up, it means that roots 
We're down. And many of you here today, but all of us, have something that could be better, something that could be fixed, something that could be broken. And there's only one. See, if you could fix it yourself, the issue never would have arisen. But fact of the matter is, is that even when we fix things, it still remains temporary and that same problem can continue to arise. Whether it be with your children, whether it be with your grandchildren, whether it be with your spouse, or maybe, just maybe, you could be the issue all in itself. So my prayer for you today is, is that by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, He would gently show you where you're falling short. And maybe for some people here today, it's just humbling yourself to realize that you're not in control. And stop fighting. Stop trying. You're not the one that's supposed to be in control. And maybe there's some people here that are just coexisting in their marriage. And rather than point the finger at your spouse, how's your life? How's your life? Consider that, friend. How's your life? And where's your relationship with God through all of this? Where's your prayer level through all of this? Where's your submission to the Heavenly Father through all of this? Maybe there's some people here that have need in their life of provision. They don't know where the next thing is coming from. Well, I've got good news for you. It comes from the hand of God. It comes from the hand of God. But that's where your faith has to be. That's where your faith has to be, is that God is going to provide it exactly when you need it. It may come in different ways than you're expecting to receive it, but that is the beauty and the glory of God. And maybe there's some people here that have walked away from salvation. Maybe it's been a short walk. Maybe it's been a long journey. Nonetheless, nonetheless, you've walked away from accepting all of the good that God has for you, whether it be from hurt, whether it be from anger, whether it be for pride, whether it be for selfishness, which really that's what it all comes down to anyway, isn't it? Whatever the reason, whatever the skies, whatever the lie, the good news is, is that God has called you home here today. What will you do with the invitation? put it all. The reason it's taken so long up to this moment is because you've continued to put it off. And then maybe there's some people here that have never asked Jesus Christ to be the personal Lord and Savior of their life. The good news is, is that God sent Jesus to die on the cross so that you, yes, you could be forgiven of every sin that you've ever committed. It doesn't matter how, how far, how long, how tough, how deep you've wandered. It doesn't matter what you've committed. At this very moment, because of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, because he rose and is alive again, at this very moment, he is willing to take every sin that you've ever committed and wash it farther than the east is from the west. And see, the good news to that is, if God Almighty is willing to forgive and forget every sin, every crime, every deed that you've ever committed against Him, the good news is that today you can do. You can do. You can do. So if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus Christ truly to be the Lord and Savior of your soul, and you want to make sure that if you died today, you know that your soul would rest in heaven for all of eternity, then it's just as simple, it's just as easy as asking the Lord to come into your life, recognizing the work that he did on the cross, believing with your heart and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and the word of God says that you will be saved. 
so just right where you are, right where you are, if that's you today, if that's you, right where you are, and you want the Lord to save your soul, you're tired of fighting, you're tired of pushing, you're tired of grinding on your own, relying on your own strength, you're tired of wondering what's next, and you're willing to surrender your soul to the Lord right where you are, I would encourage you to pray a prayer and repeat after me right where you are, Lord Jesus. I am a sinner. And I recognize, Lord, that you died on the cross so that I could be forgiven of my sins. And so, Lord, I ask that you would save my soul. Come into my life. Make me a new man or a new woman, whoever you are. Whether you're a man or woman praying that prayer, you fill in the blank. But continue to pray this. Continue to pray this. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would transform me I ask that you would fill me with the power and the baptism of your Holy Spirit. I ask that you would show me the spiritual gifts that you have in my life. I ask that you would create in me a hunger for your word like I've never had before. And I pray, Father, that I'm always, I would always seek your counsel over mine. And I pray, Lord. I pray, Lord, that I would never forget this moment of my first love with you. And I pray that you would remove the naysayer. And that from this day forward, I would learn to walk in victory through your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now, Father, I pray for every person that prayed that prayer. That in the name and the blood of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, that the naysayers would be removed. For whatever time in their life, it be removed for a season, if not permanently. Only you know that, Father. But I pray that no one could come up against what just took place in their life. God, I pray that today they would understand they've got victory through Christ. And Christ Jesus alone. I pray for every other person in this room that as we leave this house today, we would go in true joy, in true victory, and in the love of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that as we leave these doors today, as we go through, that we would share the gospel message, that we would understand that Jesus Christ is the only way, and that we would understand that in order to get fruit upward, our roots must go down deep downward into the word of God. And when we have godly roots, we will see godly, righteous fruit above as Isaiah 37, 31 says, and the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. If you're here today and you've said that prayer, you repeat it after me, I've got something that I want to give you before you leave here, and I want to know who you are so I can give you a gift, and it's free. But if you prayed that prayer, I invite you to welcome your hand. Anybody in here say that prayer today? And that ask the Lord to save the soul. I'm not going to call you forward. I don't, I, don't, I don't feel led to do that today. But I know that I heard some folks saying it. I know that I heard some folks praying it. And what I want you to do is, before you leave this house, I want you to come see me. So that I can introduce myself to you. Congratulate you. And I want to give you a little gift. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ. All of God's children set together, church. Amen and amen. The good news is...